Hi, my name is Alan Samry. I'm a local author and a historian, and I worked for several years at Ferrell Public Library from about 2007 until 2019, and that's kind of where I got my love of uh, Ferrell history because a lot of times I was the go-to person for people that had questions. You know, a lot of times when you're living a com new to a community, you want to know some history about it, and so I enjoyed being able to provide that information to my patrons and visitors as well to the library. So that sort of parlayed into, you know, getting my library degree. And all along, uh, prior to the library experience, I was a journalist. So um, I wrote for the Fairhope Courier. That was my first job in Fairhope. So that was kind of an exciting thing for me. Like, ooh, here I am following in the footsteps of E.B. Gaston and, and uh, Francis Crawford, who was his daughter. So then from there, I guess I uh, I wrote Stump the Librarian, which is a memoir and a history of amputees because I'm a below-the-knee amputee. Growing up, I was a patient at Shriners Hospital and didn't really know many amputees other than the ones that I would occasionally see at the hospital. And so uh, as I got older, I thought, well, of course there's amputees. I wanted to shine a light on some of them, not only currently, but also in history to kind of show, hey, this is these were people that were already out there that uh, people like Henry Highland Garnett, an African-American abolitionist, that people kind of had heard of but didn't know like all these wonderful and fantastic things that they did in history on one leg. So that was my first book. I wrote Clay City Tile in 2020 based on some history that I had done um, in Fairhope. I had done an undergraduate thesis and that kind of parlayed into this a uh, bigger project of kind of inventorying all these Clay City tile buildings and really just became a quite sadly an obsession. <laughs> kind of funny, but you know, true. Like there's this idea that, oh, okay, well, once they identify this building or they say, what is this orange red looking building with these funny looking blocks? And I'm like, well, that's Clay City tile and you need to know all about that. And that kind of reverted back to the, my time at the Ferrell Public Library too. I was, did a short stint at the Ferrell Museum of History as the director and enjoyed my time there and just um, different things called me. And I've been working at Coastal Alabama Community College as the part-time librarian there uh, since 2018. And so enjoy my, enjoy my experience working with the students and helping them with research and just, you know, kind of being the, the face on the campus for, for, for students and for faculty as well. I guess since the pandemic, I've been rather fascinated by wanting to be outside and walking around my hometown. And so I started this company called Fair Hope by Foot. I take people, you know, I walk people from, usually from the Welcome Center and we walk downtown and one of the tours, I'll take them down to the bay and back. And I take a lot of locals because we have so many people moving here. They don't really know the history of their community either. So I like to, you know, walk them by all these fantastic historical buildings from, you know, the single tax building to Dr. Mershon's office, the Feral Film office, which was, you know, a pharmacy. And so a lot of history just in this short walk. and and of course expose them to all the Bay history as well, so. I met Jim and Dana Maloney, well, let's see, it was about a year and a half ago now, and they were interested in more learning more about Faroe history, but then they were also learning, wanted to learn more about uh, Jubilee Suites, the, the hotel that they had purchased. And so I said, well, yeah, sure, that's exactly what I love to do is research, you know, especially historic buildings. And I didn't know any more about it than they did, really, except I had heard some stories. You know, when I started doing the research, I thought, well, these are fascinating stories, but only about half of them are true, at least as regards Jubilee Suites and this building here. Uh, rather than this, that 601, which is uh, North Mobile, which is the Volanta Hotel. But that's also within the same neighborhood where Jubilee Suites is. And so I wanted to get a little bit of background about that first and tell you a little bit about how that story and how Volanta, the neighborhood, begins. And then we'll segue a little bit more into more about the Jubilee Suites and the several hotels that it's been named over the years. First, we've got to go back to around 1910 or 1912, and there was a wharf here at Volanta, just south of where Fly Creek is, okay? Just envision this wharf that went out not nearly as far as the Fairhope Pier. It was probably about 600 feet and a little bit deeper water there. 
uh, there were bay boats coming to, Fer coming to Valanta, and they, this was one of the five stops that they made along the eastern shore. And there was a reason for it, and the reason was that there were, there were some developers that were trying to, A, build a railroad, and also build a neighborhood. So the Fairhope community was already kind of growing, and then some what we would call speculators, if you're a single tax person, they purchased a large tract of land here, just north of Grand Ave, all the way to basically to Fly Creek and, and where the Yacht Club is, up the hill. That's the first thing they did, was they established the pier and the wharf. Uh, there was a post office. They built the hotel. The Volanta Hotel was built around 1910 or 1912. There's not a lot of detail when it was there. My perspective is that the developers built it to attract people so that they would get them off the bay boat, look at the wonderful land and, and see, the, see the, not just from the bluff, but see the land that they were going to purchase and, and, you know, give them the full tour. The locals that started it, there was a man named P.A. Parker, Prescott Parker. Uh, he was a man from Worcester, part of the Worcester Single Tax Club, and he followed the Fairhope Single Taxers down here and moved here in the late 1890s. Mr. Parker came down and was all full in with the single taxers. And because he was a surveyor, right, this was the guy that, you know, he laid out a lot of the streets and a lot of the territory for the single taxers early on. So there, were, there was a bit of a conflict between the single taxers and the new folks that were moving here that didn't quite believe in the single tax theory. So one of the early developers in Volanta was a man named Ira Jones. And he also connected with Prescott Parker and his, I think it's his brother-in-law, Mr. Baldwin. And they had a sort of a falling out with the single taxers. They didn't agree necessarily with everything that was going on. And this was around the same time that the city of Fairhope formed in 1908. And so there was a bit of a fracture. And Mr. Prescott and Mr. Baldwin joined up with Mr. Jones, who was developing Volanta at the time and uh, building the railroad and really interested in, in promoting this as a new resort and place to settle. And they did that. And by around 1915 or so, uh, Mr. Larson was the one that purchased the hotel. And Mr. Larson uh, was a native of Sweden, and him and his wife moved here, and they were also part of that initial core, initial group of people that were, were part of this Volanta settlement. Similar to tourism today, a lot of times people just came over. Uh, there were a very few houses here at the time, maybe four. So most of it was spent, most of the time was spent at the hotel, right? Entertaining and, and visiting and and things like that. And so the Larsons were the hotel owners for about 30 years. Even after they sold the hotel, it always, was, it always kept reverting back to the Larson Hotel. And so this is one of those pieces of history that kind of got tangled in, um, even though we're much, many years later, it got tangled in with the history of Jubilee Suites. But even before that, I think there was this interesting railroad battle, okay? So I have to talk about the railroads because people love railroads. And I wasn't really a fascinated railroad guy until I started reading more about it. And so, so the Volanta Railroad, you know, they had big dreams. The dreams were to take rail service from Volanta all the way over to Pensacola, Florida and also detour, so there'd be alternate routes to Bay Manette, and then there'd also be a route down to Fort Morgan. Think about that in terms of like how we travel today and on the roads. These folks wanted to build rail that way, all the way across Pensacola Bay and into downtown Pensacola. But at the same time, E.B. Gaston, the founder of Fairhope, also had the railroad dream, right? He was like, we need to make this happen. And so somewhere around 1914, uh, Mr. Gaston starts raising capital and selling stock for the People's Railroad. I think the original rail service was in October of 1914 is when they first took people up the hill. And it stopped at every block because again, Fairhope was busier than Volanta was at the time because there were just a lot more people community members, a lot more residents full-time, and so a lot more tourists as well. So it stopped at every hotel going up the hill. So again, we get to this interesting history of hotels, um, and so the Volanta Hotel was that very same thing here. The difference is, is that they were, they were having trouble finding buyers here. Um, it didn't have anything here except the post office and the little uh, dry goods kind of location. It wasn't quite as big as Fairhope. All this is, you know, they're trying to build their community. They've got 
believe it or not, they've got about three miles of rail, okay? So the three miles of rail goes, basically follows the Volanta Gully, and then goes, if you think about it, it goes south on Ingleside, about to where the hospital is, where Morphe is. That's the Volanta Railroad. Smaller gauge, but few occasional passengers, more of a sales pitch, right, to get people to come here. And the other, the People's Railroad went all the way up the hill, kind of did a circle around the water tank at Section and Fairhope Ave, went south on Bancroft, and sort of curled onto Morphe, but ended at school. So the rails never met. And then in 1916, we had a hurricane, major hurricane. Um, there was an 06 hurricane, did a lot of damage, but the 1916 damage destroyed both piers pretty much the Fairhope Pier and the Volanta Pier. And so the Fairhope folks were able to recover. The Volanta Pier never recovered. Shortly after that, we had World War I, and so, you know, there was fewer tourists, and, and you know, during the war years, it just, um, things sort of settled out, I guess, if you will. Uh, the People's Railroad continued till about 1923. The hotel continued but they never rebuilt the rail. So they were still getting tourists here, but it was on a much smaller scale. It was similar to Seacliff. Seacliff had, I don't know if they had a public house, but they had some, some homes over there that, again, were back to this whole, you know, the Eastern Shore community. There were people here that decided to stay here, and there were also some seasonal folks here as well. We'll pick up, I guess, where the Larsons sell the hotel um, in the 40s, World War II, happens, right? So there's, you know, there's a major shift, you know, there's, there's the roaring 20s, which are fabulous, and then, and then there's the depression, and things crash in 1929, and then the U.S. is at war, and the shipbuilding takes off in Mobile. The Larsons, after they sold the hotel, there was a man named Dr. Jordan, and he ran Jordan Clinic, which is where the Hampton Inn is today. He purchased the Volanta Hotel to take care of soldiers who had already returned. It was more convalescent. And he did that for several years. He did that until till the end of the war. And then in 1949, he sells it to the Gaston Lee Veterans of Foreign Wars. Uh, and they owned it until 1987. Uh, when the Mashburns purchased it and converted it into um, a bed and breakfast. So we're back to how, you know, the Volanta Hotel stories and the stories of Jubilee Suites get crossed. And so we have to go back to 1944, during World War II, when Don and Hazel May Shoup purchased the property with the goal of, of building a hotel. And by 1945, they, per they actually purchased from the government a barracks from Chicxulub Creek. And there were always stories about, oh, well, they shipped it over by Babo. Well, no, Don Shoup, who's their son, uh, set the story straight and says that, no, it was, it was actually trucked over. And b before it was even trucked over, the Shoups and their grandparents and an uncle and the kids all built two Clay City tile cottages here first, and then really just waited for them to dismantle it on one side so they could ship it over. There were no building materials here because World War II had everything running in such short supply. This was one of the reasons why they said, well, we're just gonna take a surplus building from Mobile and, and, um, and truck it over, and so they did. There's this really cool story about it being a family event. So in other words, this is a multi-generational story. So in addition to the grandparents and Hazel May and Charles building it, there were kids were involved as well. So we think about it like a, a true family build, multi-generational story, and all to build a place for people to come and stay on the Eastern Shore. So we can't lose sight of that, the fact that they, they were building this because they wanted to welcome more people into their home. It took them about 16 months to put it all together. And then July 3rd, 1947, they opened the El Nathan Hotel. El Nathan is Hebrew for a gift from God. And so this created quite a stir. In the naming of the hotel, it turns into Don, of course, and his other brothers being called Jew boy and all these insults because they thought that the family was Jewish. Well, they were not Jewish, they were Christian, 
but they felt that the hotel was a gift from God for them to, to be able to do it and to be able to celebrate, um, you know, not only their family, but to entertain guests at the hotel. Because of the controversy with the name, it obviously doesn't do well. It's not very successful. Word, travel, word of mouth, as we all know, uh, travels faster than, than anything. So by October of 1947, he renames it the Sunset Beach Hotel. I don't think you can get any clearer than the Sunset Beach Hotel, knowing all of our wonderful sunsets in Fairhope and along the bay here. It's completely idyllic and I think completely appropriate, but it's also now October, and so they've got work to do. The family really pitches in and it becomes a really a wonderful location. And then I think it was in 1950 is when a man named Converse Harwell writes about the shoops. Converse Harwell was uh, the husband to the potter, Edith Harwell in Fairhope. They moved here in the late 30s and were very involved in the organic school. And she was a potter and taught students at the organic, but she also had the Pinewood Pottery Studio where the Eastern Shore Art Center is today. And she was what they'd call a production potter. So she made a lot of pottery, but she was also the only woman in the Southeast who was an independent potter and you know selling her wares and making a living and even in their ads it's really funny in the Ferro Courier um, it says Edith Harwell Potter and then it says Converse Harwell Potter's husband so that's how he's always identified himself but he always manages to find jobs he just he seems to be the guy that finds work wherever he needs it and he picks up this little writing gig called Along the Eastern Shore. So it's literally exactly that. I feel like the man just sort of wanders along the Eastern Shore until he runs into these stories. And so he wanders in and he meets the Shoops and tells the Shoops story. And I think that's just fascinating to me. Again, we're back to the detective work about, well, who was here and when was this? And well, if it wasn't for Converse Harwell's article, we would have like a large gap in terms of what we knew about the Shoops and, and about his visit with the family. It's really just, a, it's a very tender story. And, and I think it's also uh, indicative of why people come here because I suspect he came around sunset, probably had a libation or two while he chatted with the Shoops and talked about what their big plans were for, the, for their hotel. So. so when they renamed it, in uh, October of 1947, they also added a lot more amenities. So they were, it wasn't just the place to stay, they'd offered dining both to their guests. This was a big deal to you know, offer a full meal. In other words, you didn't always get a full meal plan when you stayed at hotels, but in this case, they added that amenity. And then they also um, invited in guests from the community as well. So it wasn't just you know, the Sunset Beach hotel for travelers. It was also for the community to, to have space as well. And then in 1950 is when it changes names again. It changes to the Eastern Shore Hotel. And that's because there's a man named John Evans that's running it now. And John Evans is, is making a go of it. The Shoops are still present, but he's the one managing the place and trying to, trying to again, make it successful. And, and so he takes over um, in, the, in the spring of that year. And so he tries his best to attract more. He opens the dining room and also is trying to um, bring in local communities. So still not successful, unfortunately. And so in 1953, the Shoops actually sell to Mansiel and Margaret Patrick. They sell it to them for $45,000. And they, have, they plan extensive renovations. This is the first First, we hear about any changes from that original um, barracks. Anyway, that, this is like the first like, okay, well, we've got this barracks, but it's really not, it's not really what people are expecting when they arrive here. And so the Patricks are like, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, we paid 45 grand for it, but we're gonna probably sink in significantly more to make it successful. And, and they do. And so there's a, an article about the purchase, you know, the transfer of the purchase from the Shoops to the Patricks. And again, they had this idea of, you know, extensive renovations. So because the Patricks are chamber members, they have chamber events here. And that becomes like another connection because really you might be a chamber member, but if people don't see where your place is, how can they, how can they help you promote it and sell it? Again, this is the 50s. So 
the economy is pretty good and there's lots of choices and so they're just in the in the market to promote their choices and they're doing and they're doing they're very successful at that but then in 1960 the place is purchased again by uh, Earl and Catherine Forsman they drop the hotel part of it altogether and so now it's just the Eastern Shore apartments and then in 1963 the Watersons purchase the Eastern Shore apartments and then they in turn sell it in 1975. Stays the same name. All of these folks are all owners and residents. That's important because they're all living here at the same time they're hosting their guests and hosting local events. And there's also short-term stay and long-term stay. Some people are seasonal, right? You forget that, you know, this was a place to winter. And so some of the guests stayed here for, you know, five or six months and then others stayed year round. And then in 1975, Roy and Willa Dean Graves uh, took it over and they also were owners and residents. And it was still called the Eastern Shore Apartments, but this is where it changes a bit. This becomes an affordable place to stay with a gorgeous view. So most of the people that are living here in the 70s and 80s are either retirees or widowers or single women. I don't know what their model was, but again, it, they were apartments now. We were back to sort of a neighborhood here because the, it was just a quiet community. In 1987, it, shi it shifted again. Joseph and Glenda Gravely purchased the Eastern Shore Apartments in 1987, and they created Away at the Bay which was a bed and breakfast. And Away at the Bay was here, again, this would be turned into an upscale bed and breakfast. Um, they had lots of amenities to do, lots of things to do along the bay. It was also a, a kind of a retreat. There were events here, there were weddings, there were chamber events still continuing here. You know, anything to, again, pull the community in while also bringing in tourists to take advantage of the bay. And during that time, the, the Gravelys, they made two additions in the early 2000s. They added onto the building on the north side. And then in the late 2000s, they demolished the Clay City Tile buildings. And then they expanded into where we are now, which is uh, on, the, on the Azalea Suite. In 2017, Dana and Jim Maloney really followed family to Fairhope their son and daughter-in-law were having a grandbaby. That was the reason why they, they really wanted to be close to their family, to their newest grandbaby. And so in 2017, they purchased what was then away at the Bay. And then after about four months of rejuvenation in the spring of 2018, they opened Jubilee Suites Boutique Hotel. There's a wonderful piece of history here that's part of the original barracks, but really the reason why you want to be here is for the seven exquisite suites, most overlooking Mobile Bay. We welcome you to Fairhope on your next visit. <laughs>